Welcome to Senate Education this Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. Ms. St. James, in our folders, we have uh, an updated CTE bill, I believe. Not updated. Not updated, sorry. It's a policy decisions. So it's it's as introduced? Yeah. Okay, it is as introduced. So mm -hmm. it's in our, uh, as I said to Ms. St. James, my dream, life dreams, would include Moving CTE, literacy, libraries, center machines bill on on um, refugees, um, something to do with electronic devices, all by a week from Friday. And that leaves us miscellaneous ed, some things having to do with boards and commissions, and maybe a couple other little things to do when we get back. That's, but make it more dense. So, Ms. St. James, if you want to just take us through before we hear from Mr. Smith, uh, CTE, where we're at, some of the decision points, uh, things of that nature would be great. Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, what we're working with today is um, <laughs> S304 as introduced, which is the committee bill. Um, and I, we did a very high level. I don't think it even took two minutes Super to high level. through it. So I thought maybe we could do a little bit of a deeper look at it and I could, <clears throat> you know, answer any questions or, we, right. you know, if we're going to work on any sections. Um, do you want to talk about? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, the finance, we are still, I think, trying to figure some of the finance stuff out. I'm looking at my agency of education point person. Uh, still quite a bit that we need from all of you on the finance section. <clears throat> I'll leave it there. Uh, I know the secretary is coming in tomorrow. And so if she and others could really come in with some financing components to this bill, that would be very helpful. <clears throat> For the record, Ted Fisher, my agency of education, I'm the agency's director of communication and legislative affairs. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have uh, sh had some conversations with uh, Beth, and she's given us some questions, and we're answering those. And um, we, sh I, I think there's still some more drafting work to do between between the agency and and Beth. But my hope is that we'll have something um, ready by Friday. Yeah, I'll be ready tomorrow, um, actually. Uh, Secretary Boucher is actually on the calendar for Friday. Oh, you should try to my college stand on Friday. But I would encourage you to be ready a day early. Uh, here's the thing. I've seen some of those edits. I think you guys really have to have some serious conversations before you bring that work forward. Uh, I'll be frank. I think the agency really needs to dig in and bring a, a solid product to the committee when Agency right. I appreciate yeah, it. For now, Miss St. James, if you would take us through the sections that are not related to finance, that would be helpful. Um, sure. Section um, one. So we're going to work. The bill is introduced, and we're going to jump right to page two. We're going to skip over the statement of purpose. Um, section one is, um, and you'll see there's um, reader assistance headings. That's what we call the language in between the asterisks. So um, there might be several sections kind of grouped together. So I think it might be easiest to look at each topic. So we'll start with CTE tuition. And if anybody has any concerns at any point, things you like or don't like, let's jump in and- Have my colored pen ready. Great. Mm -hmm. um, so the first um, section one under the CTE tuition um, reader heading would be a, an amendment. And we're primarily working in chapter 37, which is the CTE um, chapter here. Um, so secondary student tuition is the statute, section 1552 is the statute um, that uh, talks about um, high school uh, secondary student tuition. So there's adult CTE and then there's secondary CTE. So we're talking about high school here. Um, how um, the money's flowing um, and how tuition is charged to a school district, which is the model right now. So this bill is proposing right now, tuition is charged to a school district on the average of the district's three prior years 
um, full-time equivalent student enrollment in the CTE. And the bill proposes to just base the tuition on the district's prior year full-time enrollment. So going from an average of three years prior, I think you hear it referred to as the six semester average, um, going down to just one year. Um, and there's a- Yes, please. So anybody that can speak to the logic of the change? I mean, so I gave us some come from somewhere. Why we're dropping it down? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems logical take a more uh, yeah. longer range view than a shorter range. So we have a CTE report that we went, we did high level overview of last week. It comes from that. We'll also hear from Mr. Smith, who represents the CTEs. We'll talk a little bit about the logic behind it. Please. Point of clarity, Vermont Retail Lumber Dealers Association. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, and, but is interested in this topic. Yes, sir. Uh, and then we had some testimony last year about getting kids in early, sooner the better, right, right. Uh, and that's sort of the logic be behind it. Is that because the program as it exists now doesn't include them, and if it was three years prior, it always seemed like that if it was three years or one year, those would be kind of like hampering and dampering, dampening up that. So as I recall, and we'll have Jody Emerson in to take, talk to us a little bit more about this, but last year, one of the things what we talked about was how, yeah, when you get there really late in your educational career, it's number one, not a lot of students can take part in it. We're still, we know that we have a lot of kids that are leaving school, uh, dropping out of school, that kind yeah. of thing. And I think that's one of the reasons I get why they have more. Get, those are yeah. great reasons. And I support that 100%. Yeah. Okay, no, no worries. Okay. Hey, no, it's about figuring out what the tuition cost is. Oh, the tuition cost itself, Mr. Fisher. Uh, for the Ted Fisher, again, um, so the six semester average that is in the bill currently, and we're actually asking to be struck effective this coming fiscal year, um, what it what it is, a, what the effect has been in recent years has been that it has um, depressed the amount of funding they receive based on the tuition. And that's a, partly a COVID effect. We have lower participation rates in the in a couple of years back. So, so CTE centers have more students this year, but the, to, the amount of tuition that they're getting is based on that six semester average or that three years of, of program data. And so this was one of the recommendations of the APA report that I referenced last week. It's a recommendation that we would like to do immediately because we think it will help. Um, and in the out years, there's, I think you're gonna wanna hear more from us next year about um, you know, if, if we move on in terms of CTE finance as part of implementation, it may be that several years of data becomes a useful thing again, but that's a we don't know yet kind of question. For right now, we have an immediate problem. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No, I was still going to respond to Senator Weeks's question, but Mr. Fisher did. Great. Great. So, so thanks to the conforming change along the same lines. So this is... Um, uh, making a confirming change when we're looking at tuition charged, you look on page three, and instead of looking at that six semester average or three year prior average, we're looking at the one year full time equivalent enrollment. And then we're going to go to section three on page three, line five, CTE opportunity for grades six through ten. So section fifteen fifty four. Section 1551A, the responsibility of local boards and sending districts. We looked at this language a little bit last year when we were looking at lines nine. Just tell me where you are. Each three? Yeah. Section three? Section three. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. If you look at lines nine and ten, we talked about uh well, nine through twelve really. Um we talked we looked at this language a little bit last year, and these are the grades right now that state law requires CTE to be offered for, right? Eleven and twelve. So if you go to page four, this section proposes to add the requirements to the statute. So for grades six through eight, the bill proposes to require school districts to provide uh, those grades with career enrichment and exposure, including at least one annual visit to the school district's regional career and tech ed center. And then for grades nine through 10, the bill proposes to require school districts to provide a genuine opportunity to participate fully in pre-tech and exploratory career and technical course motion. Any questions before we move on? 
Um, section four of the bills are on page four, line eight. Proposing to, and I think we're going to be the same version here. I just made me nervous when you all changed the pages there. Um, uh, section four is proposing to add a new statute to Title 16 in, the, in Chapter 37, Comprehensive Career Development Policy, which would require the Secretary of Education in consultation with the Commissioner of Labor to develop a model comprehensive career development policy and implementation plan for all high school students. The secretary would be required to review the model policy not less than every five years and make a determination as to whether it needs to be updated. And the policy has to address the following items. The role of CTE centers in providing career-focused education, how each supervisor union's career education and counseling policy practices align with the CTE programs of study, how supervisory unions will work with CTE centers and other supervisory unions in the region to develop common and joint courses and approaches to CTE career exploration and CTE exposure on page five now. The model policy has to have a plan for meeting the pretext and exploratory CTE requirements that we just walked through. Those were the new additions for grades um, nine and 10 and six through eight. And then the model policy also has to provide a plan for meeting the career enrichment and exposure requirements. Um, so that's nine through uh, grades nine through or grades six through eight, and then um, that subdivision four is grades uh, nine through ten. And then each SU is required to adopt a policy on this topic that is at least as comprehensive as the model policy adopted by the secretary. And if they don't, they fail to adopt a policy or procedures, they will be presumed to have adopted the most current model policy and procedures published by the secretary. And that's similar to what you see for the school branding model policy requirement and paving graph eventually model policy. Thank you. Senator Shane. When Senator Shane, when you uh, I was looking at the effective date and it's uh, July 1st, 2024, it's all of this. When will this particular section uh, be required to be completed because we still don't have a secretary. Yep. So if you look at section five, this is the this is the transition or the development for okay. section four. Got okay. Thank you. Yep. So let's just walk through that. Uh, so Senator Ewan. Oh, I want to answer this. Uh, she just did. Okay. Yeah. Um, each supervisory union so speak on page mm -hmm. five. Is that so? These are schools that don't necessarily have a career and technical center. No, this is each SU is required to adopt a comprehensive career development policy. So that seems to be separate from CTE. I mean, a career development policy could be anything. And that, and what this language. So you can make this whatever you want, right? It's titled Career Development Policy, and then the model policy has to include several items, and it's all centered around CTE, career and technical education. Um, it's also it's all centered around career and technical education, so career development. I, I see what you're saying, right? There's no guidance counselor referenced here, right? Like. Yeah, there could be other things that go into career development. So um, you could certainly change the name of it or add items to the model policy. Okay, I'm just- You're just don't correct me if I'm, so you're concerned, like it's so broad, you could come out with comprehensive career development plans that have nothing to do with CTEs in a way, or- Yeah, it's yeah. odd. It's odd. It's, I mean, it, it, get, it starts getting into the question of like, what is education? <laughs> it's kind of, I don't, I don't know. It, it, well, it's it's strange to me. It's a that the CTE is specific. That's a whole other conversation. Do we really want to go down that road? I don't know. Maybe. This is yeah. Tell us again. So uh, tell us what exactly every SU would be doing here. So the first thing, so the SU could be adopting a policy yeah. based on a model policy that AOE has to develop. Right. And that model policy is the one that we just went through. 
that talks about CTEs. Correct. Yeah. So that's it. That's it. So they would be, so SUs are required to adopt a policy. Yeah. At least as comprehensive. As the one that we see on page four, as section a, four. Well, so, a, so this is, yes. So section four, lines 16 through four mm -hmm. on the next page, line five, or page five. So subdivisions one through five. Mm -hmm are putting into law what the model policy has to address. Yeah, so on page five, line 11, between the words comprehensive and career, why would you drop in CT? Keep, keep it focused. But Senator Julep's concern, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator Julep, is page five, line six, comprehensive career development. We just shit this. So this. yeah, yeah. No. Uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying, and I want to give credit where credit's due. This is Senator um, Clarkson's good work. Something she's been involved in. She drafted the bill. Um, it's kind enough just to add my name, and now it's committee bill. How do we improve career technical education in the state? How do we get more kids involved? All that kind of thing. So I think maybe for now we do just drop in, make it career technical education consistently throughout so that the studies and everything reflect that work. So would that make you feel? I, it's still really, I don't know, I still, I have to sit with this a little while. It just seems odd. And I guess I would like to hear from people in the field. Yeah. Um, Cause I have mixed feelings. I think career education is super important and we should be, um, encouraging kids to think about their careers but there's also learning for learning's sake and the joy of learning and just i, I don't know i i and not I, having it like so career career, career. So, so described and so mm -hmm. so that's all that's what and that's what and this doesn't seem necessarily connected to a cte program it mm -hmm. seems kind of like dropped in yeah yeah please well but my understanding of the bill is we're not trying to uh, solve all of the career development problems in our high schools or middle schools, for that matter. Uh, and the bill, all the majority of the language in the bill is all about CTE. So the study, for example, policy development, development policy, page four, line 16, it's about CTEs. Uh, line 18, it's about CTE. I mean, each, each bullet is about CTEs until you get to development of the report. So does, does every supervisory union have a CTE? There are, um, no, 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 there's, there's far more C uh, supervisory unions than regional regions for CTEs. But that's part of the problem. See, if they don't, what do they, how do they address the shortage, the shortcoming? And they need to develop a, a strategic plan, a perspective, on what's if, if it's lacking, what's lacking, if it's strong, you know, what what enhancements could they use? What what districts could they um, partner with to solve short to me? We we're not trying to solve all of the high school career ambitions here. We're trying to solve this particular shortcoming. That's all I mean. Mr. Fisher. Again, Ted Fisher, Agency of Education. Um, I agree with everything that was just said. I, I love this. Um, so, and with thanks to you, Mr. Chair, and to Senator Clarkson, this language was proposed by the AOE. Um, we and I and I understand your question about it being limited, but the, the term comp comprehensive. To to your question a moment ago about where is CTE access, the problem that we're trying to one of the problems we're trying to solve with the CTE bill is the fact that every district flexible CTE is a flexible pathway for all students of Vermont. Um, it is a um, but but we see from the data that if a and most of our CTE centers are hosted or or on the same campus mm -hmm. as a high school, and we see from the data that the students who go to school next to a CTE or are geographically closer to a CTE are far more likely to go to the CTE center. There are some of it's just geographic barrier, but in the many of these places, when you're talking about getting into the later years of your education, exploring flexible pathways, CTE is a valid decision-making 
and we see the data where you know de decision to make as part of that. And I absolutely um, see it here. Your um, your point, Senator Gulick, about it's more than just learning. From our perspective, and I and I understand that this is focused just on CT when we talk about comprehensive career development, but from our perspective, this is one flexible pathway of many that students could choose, but it's the one that has some of these issues. And that's why we want the comprehensive career development policy in every SU to be focused on how do we make sure that students have full access to this one flexible pathway. Um, okay. That's not going to solve the problem by itself. There are questions of transportation and logistics and bell times and other things. But we do know from, from data and from conversations that students um, who don't go, sometimes who, who don't go to high school in the district that operates the CT center are sometimes even dissuaded in right. most extreme yeah. cases from going to CT. And that's one of the problems we'd like to address by part of this. And so I, if you think that there should be more language about um, inclusion in flexible pathways or that kind of how, how it's included in the broader flexible pathway no, system, no. we'd be happy to, to, to work on that with you. That was helpful. But that was helpful. But it, and that's looks, the focus. And it looks like this is going to be a policy that sits at the school board level. Yes. Okay. And that's the intent that will be behind our drafting of the model policy, which is that if we focus entirely on just solving the CTE center's problems, we may be missing part of the conversation. Okay. I think that's, I think that helps me get my, my head around it a little bit more. Do you want any edits at this point, or do you want to sit with it a little bit? Can I mean, we hear from like some superintendents or principals? Yeah, we're going to get from all the VEs. Yeah. Yeah, okay. on it. But um, I just, because usually when you have a policy at the board level, obviously it should trickle down into that actual day-to-day -day running of the district to yeah. a certain extent. So I'm just wondering what that would be. So, and um, just a general question about the curriculum. I mean, is, it, is every CTE center going to be cookie cutter uh, as far as teaching the same Technical. Well, I think they're very that different. Be, yeah, and yeah, very. So um, is that specified in here? Well, that's how they've sort of, I think, evolved. For example, I don't, Bennington, I don't think we have. We have a little bit of a, a, a forest management program, but I think we've got bigger forest management programs, St. John's Fair, depending, I think, on the geography and the needs of the, the town and, and you know, all the, that. The local economy. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the needs of students, yeah. you know, what they're interested in doing. Yeah. 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 I, I, can I add a little bit to that just yeah. from um, experience? Uh, but I, I do feel like tech centers are getting better about regionalizing. And I think, for example, like Burlington and Essex both had a foods program. Mm -hmm. But then when we lost our high school, we lost a whole bunch of kids in the food program. And Essex had such a good one that we were like, let's just let them do food. But Burlington has a great aviation program that is so specific to like being near the airport and that other schools would be able to do that. But it's so So that's right. That's, but yeah, that's, that's really right. that's a really good point to be thinking like regionally in terms of But are we trying to make this general enough so that we can let each uh School board decide which what they're going to teach. Yeah, we're not we're not going to we don't want to interfere okay. with, interfere with that. We just want more people to be okay. thinking about CTE education and general. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what I'm curious. I since AOE is in the room. I mean, how far back do we want to take a look at this and, and create? You know, we want that we, we want to foster their conversation amongst the SUs and amongst the CTEs about specialization. You know, like Burlington, it's got, you know, aviation, and they could attract more than just, you know, their district, surrounding districts, forestry, uh, you know, whatever. Do we want to really foster uh, subject matter expertise, you know, like uh, specializations? You know, my, my point, my question is, should we give that question to uh, AOE and let them come back with, their recommendations based on it, or is that too, too is that too broad? There, yeah, there right. is a suggestion. Do you remember from the AOE suggestions for next year to be thinking about or looking into a one CTE district yeah. state, which would yeah. could accomplish that? 
or not. I mean, it's, it's, so I'm, okay, so my question is, should that be part of this policy development now, or is that power, is that policy development for the future? I, mean, I don't know what AOE is ready okay. to do. How would you phrase that question in this? If we were saying, put it in the bill, how would you phrase the question that you'd want AOE to look at? Uh, so, brought up by my colleague, do we want them all to look alike? The simple answer is no. So what do we want them to look like? What are we trying to enhance? We're trying to enhance regional ex uh, expertise, in, you know, industrial or geographic or whatever. So, uh, you know, I I, I'm not sure how to yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but that, that's helpful. Yeah, Ted. I'll, I'll just note that this is, uh, yeah, sorry again, Ted Fisher. Um, I'll just note that um, this is a com this has been a longstanding question and conversation, and and um, that is, and we, as Senator Gulick just just said, we are we are punted on this this year. We are actively involved in the governance. The, the the questions you're trying to solve is the governance issues, and it gets even deeper. So like, we have one aviation program right now. I'm I'm ninety percent sure it's really difficult for students from Southern Vermont potentially to come up to that aviation program. So maybe we need more, but where does the boundary go? Right now to Senator Felix example, if your program doesn't operate a program, let's say you don't have um, a culinary program, you can send to another district. But if you have a culinary program that's full, you can't send to, you can't send the students who didn't make it into that program. That's so those kind of issues are what we'd like to tackle next year. And maybe it's a CTE district, maybe it's other things. We are actively working on that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we know from Mrs. Ms. Emerson, right. there are a lot of kids that want to go to- Exactly. Area. And so part of, that, part of that finance conversation is also like, maybe we need to incentivize more access to certain programs, if you remember my comment from last week. But um, uh, some of that will be coming back. I just checked in the bill because we had at one point asked for a sunset on this because we really are serious about governance. We don't want to do, we want to do as much as we can this year and get us working. I don't see a sunset in this version of the bill, but a sunset for you. to sunset the finance changes, we don't do governance next year. Oh, we, had, we had suggested that you sunset the changes before they take effect. If the general assembly next year doesn't act, um, which is something that you could consider doing. We would recommend. Senator Kishima and Senator I mean, I was trying to think of language for you know, getting to the issue of not having cookie cutter CTEs and trying to incorporate language about the needs and available resources that are in an area. I mean, if Brattleboro doesn't have a culinary program, for example, and there's just no one for miles and miles that could teach that, I don't know that it would make sense to, you know, force that requirement. Um, but if it's not available there, I, I think there should be a way to see, you know, what type of interest exists among the student body and who wants to travel 45 minutes or an hour right. to uh, anything that there's there a culinary program there. So, but are we forcing it? Force it? You say no. Oh no, I don't. Think, yeah. Right, right. I, and I, I just want to make sure. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, right. So we're looking for more flexibility. We want students to be able to go, like Senator Sheen said, if they're a group of students. So that's kind of what we're trying to also figure out. I don't know if there's language there that you can. I'm oh, sorry, Senator Wheel. My apologies. I think from, uh, I, I attended a couple meetings with. Uh, Stafford, and, yeah. you know, quite a few CT centers that are involved in that field, but the centers are, can, the primary thing they want from this bill is governance. Mm -hmm. They they don't necessarily want us to tell them what to get, yeah. but they want to set the guidelines at least so, so that there's consistency to us. That's a great reminder. I think what we're also all thinking about and grappling with is can there be at some point some overarching language that talks about you know, encouraging diverse offerings, making certain that we're not limiting kids who get closed out of programs if they can't go to maybe another program that's 20 miles away, and that's, you know, that sort of thing. So that's maybe something to think about. I think that's all allowed under law now. There's just not capacity right. for it. <laughs> is that 
I think if, if I'm wrong, someone in the room, please so correct me. Senator Hashim's constituents, if need be, could come to Bennington, permit it, uh, given that as long as the school board says, okay, we can take five or six students from Senator Hashim's district, bring them over to our district, school board okays it, no problem. I don't think there's so anything I, preventing that. I don't think there's anything legally preventing that, but Beautiful. there may be practical challenges. Of course. Transportation, weather, sure. the geography of the state, and capacity. Yeah. But I don't think there's anything that limits in state law. And, and this is, I am not an expert on, on Chapter 37 the way <laughs> that I'm intimately familiar with our tuitioning. Uh, statutes, right? So I could have missed something. Um, I'm not aware of anything in here that ties attendance at a CTE to your residence. There are CTE. If the career, I'm reading from section 1541A, the responsibility of local to boards and sending districts. If the career tech center for the region does not offer a course of study desired by a student, then the school board has to pay tuition on behalf of that student who applies and accept, is accepted to another CTE center that does offer such a course of study. The district of residence is not responsible for providing for transportation. So that seems pretty explicit. Um, but again, that seems pretty explicit. The black letter of the law doesn't always mean that's what's happening right. out there. Let's continue with the bill. And that's right. sure. Yeah, go ahead. I thought I was going, going back to the question. Yeah. The original question, which probably yeah. was yeah. it's on page five, line 11, the comprehensive career development policy. You know, is, that, is, 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 AOE, is AOE ready to embark on a comprehensive career Policy, or we're we really focusing on CTEs, or is the intent to really focus on CTEs? The intent is to focus on CTEs. So, so that would be a helpful language change. Yes. The record, Ted Fisher, reminded of education. I know that. Um, so, so CTE as a unit lives within the same division that does the other flexible pathways work. So, when we develop this policy, we see no concerns with the language as currently written. I sensitive to Senator Gulick's concerns about making sure that the right things are signposted, but are, and yes, it will be focused on CTE because the goal is to ensure that there aren't barriers to participation in CTE, but we don't, we have the capacity internally to do this work and to make sure it's aligned with other flexible pathways and is responsive to um, the, the, uh, you know, responsive to those those needs and how that would be structured. We're not concerned about our ability to deliver on the policy. And we also have have some experience in terms of this is will be adopted by boards. So we have some experience in developing these kind of board policies. We also have a close working relationship with our good friends, the School Boards Association, who with with love and due respect to my colleague in the room here, um, they 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 will be they will of course share feedback with us um, in terms of if if something isn't workable for the for the for the districts and um, we have in the past had a public comment on this we'd be happy to I, I actually don't have the language in front of me so I don't know if we have a public comment requirement in there right now but um, we you know we we developed these before we don't have no concerns about the capacity if the committee's interested in signposting slightly different things for us we would. We'd be very open to that. But. Can you change the language, and then we'll have Jeff Francis and you talk to us about it. Yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is that you'd like me to change the language, the title of the policy. That will not change the fact that AOE is only directed to develop that policy around CTE, right? So. Um. So section five, around page five, line eleven. Section five is the. Uh, direction to AOE on the timeline with which to develop this model policy. These dates, um, I'm sure AOE would like to see the agency would like to see changed. Um, they the are dates. the dates. Yeah. They're very tight. So yeah. that's a policy decision that you know you all can make, and it's easy for me to change. But 
subsection A would require AOE to develop the policy by a certain period of time, and then subsection B would require each SU to develop a policy based on the model policy within a certain period of time. And we can make changes to those dates as you mm -hmm. see fit. Um, section six, on page six, is some intent language. We're moving on to a different topic on construction aid. So section six is basically saying, if you make or you make changes to the state's construction aid program, please don't forget about CTE. It is the intent of the General Assembly to ensure that career and technical education centers and their associated facilities are appropriately and equitably included in future plans to the state's construction aid program. Can I ask a question yeah, about that? Please. If and when the school construction aid moratorium is lifted, I'll say when instead of if, um, would, is, it, is it really important that career and tech ed be explicitly named in that lifting? Uh, yes, for the record, Ted Fisher, agency. Yeah, no need, we got you. Gotcha. Sorry. I'm, no, it's just, I hate to have you always repeat yourself. Um, so we, um, we think yes. We don't want to open up to two conversations on this. So we think that intent language is probably the way to go. I'll say that, for example, because your colleagues in the House have been looking into the facilities report that the um, working group came up with, because at our request, working with the treasurer's office, we included language about CTEs in those recommendations to try to make sure that both processes are going down the same set of tracks. But we're hoping that we don't, even though CTE, very specifically the report that y'all contracted for for us to implement said do facilities, we don't wanna be duplicative or conflicting. So we're hoping it can stay in that area, but just making sure that everyone's attentive and having some intent language, I think would help with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I can just add, um, it's chapter 123 in Title 16 that contains the current language around state aid for school construction. Mm -hmm. And career and technical education facilities are already included in that. Um, okay. Yeah. But uh, there is a possibility that the legislature decides to create a new program. Um, and so I think this language is meant to say, it, in fact, it does explicitly say future updates need to include CTEs. But the current language does include um, CTE facilities. Okay. So, um, we're on page six, lines eight and nine. We're on a new topic, and that is career and technical education oversight. So the next um, couple pages are making essentially the same change regarding whose responsibility, who has responsibility for oversight of the career and technical education system. Currently, your statutes contemplate it's the State Board of Education's responsibility. So if you look at page six, line 14, current law reads the State Board has overall responsibility for the effectiveness, effectiveness of career technical education. This bill proposes to change that to the Secretary of Education. And so the next several pages make the same conforming change, where it was State Board of Education providing an oversight function, and the secretary or the agency is um, inserted into the era. That, that strikes me as incredibly logical and efficient, but tell me why the agency wants this. Yes, yeah, so so we agree there's a, there's a policy reason and there's a um, history reason. And the policy reason is that the, for two year uh, for two decades we have not updated the rule the state's rules for for career tech ed we have of course perkins five and the federal regulations and funding and program we haven't updated our state rules and I, it's not to knock the state board but i know that they are very conscious of their capacity and their role and those conversations are ongoing when we're touching when we're doing policy work and making policy recommendations to the legislature we think carefully about whether we want to touch move the rules over and that gets me to the historical reason, which is that when the agency was a department responsive to the state board, the board, the word board was often used in place of where the legislature would use agency now, because the board was the governing entity 
So the rulemaking that was done in the past was created by the, was done by the agency, proposed to the board and adopted by the board. Okay. And right now, most rulemaking is still done that way. The board gives us their directions for state board rulemaking. We draft things, they go through the public hearing process because they are a volunteer board. And I'm not saying that they, they're they heavily involved in that. As you know, they've been really grappling with rule series changes. But in this instance, um, particularly because of the governance changes, we think that it's a good policy decision in addition to uh, your updating statute that hasn't been updated since the agency um, was established and that change was made. Okay. Section eight, we're gonna skip to page 10. Um, I'm mindful of the time here. Page 10, section eight is transfer of rulemaking authority. So this section would transfer the um, statutory authority to adopt rules on career and technical education from the State Board of Education to AOE. It would actually um, deem the rules that are currently in place that the State Board of Education wrote, it would deem them to be rules of the Agency of Education, and then it would require AOE to file notice to the Secretary of State uh, about this change. So this is just, you would see the same language in any area of the law where we're uh, in Vermont, um, where we're uh, changing rulemaking authority. Um, and then the last substantive section is page 11, section nine, post-secondary program articulation agreement. So it requires, so remember post-secondary, we're talking about higher ed here. So it requires a CTE center to, to all high school CTE centers to have articulation agreements with the Vermont State Colleges Corporation. So that would include Vermont State University and CCB in the following programs, manufacturing, engineering, health sciences, education. And then I've added a definition section for articulation agreement um, that we can change as you see fit, um, but it, it's basically it allows it's, it's an agreement allowing um, secondary students to earn college credit for the work they're completing in the secondary programs, kind of like a pipeline into the post secondary programs. Okay. Are we saying to the state university college system that they have to take these credits? It requires the CTE centers and the state colleges corporation to work that out amongst themselves, but they would have to have course articulation agreements related to the following programs. How many credits that entails them hmm. um, it is not specific here, but yes, it would require articulation agreements between all secondary CTE centers and the Vermont State Colleges Corporation and those specific subject matters. Ted, do you want to say something about that? Um, absolutely. Uh, so the this is one of the, again, responsive to one of the APA recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, we have picked these programs because they, we think that they're particularly high need for now. It's worth right now for right now. Mm -hmm. It's worth discussing. And I think we have in one of our report back um, potentially whether we should expand that or, or undertake other things to encourage participation in certain groups. I'll just um, emphasize from our part what what Beth just said, which is that um, that we are not specifically not asking the uh, we're not asking you to require anything of the um, anything specific of the higher education it, uh, uh, system. More that they would be able to figure out um, what would be you know what what does it mean what would be acceptable. And this is I think and I'm not an expert, but this is similar to what we do with early college and dual enrollment, where we have students who receive credit for um, courses taken at higher education institutions that count for their high school and often count for um, count for a, high, a college credit. We also so have on saying that they shall maintain programs and and course articulation agreements. So some courses are going to be developed based on this language. I think it's more of a determination, and, and I can I can double check and confirm. But I think, and, and Secretary Boucher can probably speak to this better on Friday. But I think it's more a question of okay, so a student has done 
two years of engineering in a CTE center, how does, and, and then they're going to CCB or they're going to Vermont Tech as part of Vermont State University. How does that get factored into them now being a student at Vermont State University in the tech program, for example? Um, did, how many credits do they get? What does it count? How do we understand so that you don't have those gaps between, okay, the student took it, but it's not quite up to the standard of what the university wants for a degree program. We iron out kind of the wrinkles and lead to seamless transitions. But Ms. St. James, does this language allow state colleges to say, no thanks, this does not meet our requirements. We appreciate you taking these courses, but we're going to pass for now. Or does it say, we've got to set, you guys have to set something up to start to accept classes. It's not specific to what classes, right? but it does, this language as drafted, I would say, does require the Vermont State College Corporation to have program and course articulation agreements with all secondary CTE centers in the following programs. Is that one credit for manufacturing, 18 for engineering, seven for health sciences, and four for education. You know, I don't know. Right, right. But I would say, yes, this does require articulation agreements, um, but the substance of them is not specified yet. Jed, would you please ask the secretary to make sure that on Friday, you have a response from Chancellor Malk as to whether or not this is acceptable? Uh, to consult with the with the, whether they agree with this language or not. Yeah. So we can just either move forward or end it. Yeah, it's an opportunity. Thank you. Uh, so I guess just as a note, also uh, in preparation for Friday, I, I would like to hear more about AOE's capacity to take this on. Uh, and I don't mean that in an offensive way at all. I've been at capacity and couldn't take things on either. But I, I just want to make sure that the agency has the staff available, that they have the time and bandwidth to take this on because it seems like a big transfer to go from the Board of Education to AOE. And you know, I don't know if I'm overthinking it, but I do just want to cover that topic. Yeah, thanks, Brian. So you're talking specifically the section of the transfers to power from this state for section. That would be, yeah, that would be seven. And then I think it would be the rulemaking on. Eight, right? Section eight. Um, so I appreciate the question of concern because oftentimes when we additional work always gets added every year, and sometimes we sometimes we get additional resources, and sometimes we don't. And so I appreciate that. Um, in the governor's recommend, there is a position for the CTE team to do to support all of this work holistically. We um, think very carefully about our capacity every time we bring you something. And so we're confident that we can both engage in the rulemaking process as well as support the other requirements of this work. Um, and we don't, uh, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be sitting here asking for it if we, if we weren't, we take that really seriously. I mean, you've heard, you've heard said that my, my comments about legislative reports and our ability to sustain that because it's a large unfunded mandate every year. And so when we ask for a report back, you know that my eyes have been looking on it because I my team has to support that work. And so, um, so yes, we feel confident in doing so. Um, I think that we, and this is just a broader statement, but since you ask, I'll just say it. There's a lot of conversation about AOE's capacity and its ability to do various things and whether folks agree, and we're happy to always have that conversation. Um, I think that some of that is grounded in, in true reality, and some of it is grounded in, in concerns about the agency's role or other other things. Um, what I'll just say is we're the most staffed I've ever seen us be. We are we have the lowest rate vacancy rate in years. Um, we've been adding positions when needed for critical work like this, and we would hope that you and your colleagues in Senate appropriations would support the governor's request for an additional position on this because we think it's. But just to reiterate Senator Shim's request from the Secretary of is in it for her to confirm all of this that really Oh yeah, she would be happy to speak to it. She spoke Senator to Hewlett, um, Senator Thank you. I like the program alignment piece a lot because I for years I thought there needs to be more conversation between higher ed and K through twelve. Um I'm wondering why the university wasn't included in this. Ted, I guess that's the question for you. UVM? Why is not included? Yeah. Um, you mean in the course articulation yeah. agreements? 
I'm not certain. I can yeah. check back. Center weeks. Yeah, I was just curious, uh, Ted, going back to your comment, um, is, is AOE's uh, acceptance of this effort predicated on something, some uh, staffing uh, increase that's in the governor's uh, budget request? Or are you able to accomplish this already? You just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, the, the one point that you first in that they write. Okay. Do you want to repeat that? Is that oh, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 I want you to please. Okay. I'll just say more more directly. This is one of the governor's largest education priorities this year. He views it as must do. I get that. But can you accomplish the comprehensive policy without? We're getting... at, we're asking for a position okay. in order to do this work. Did you want to do the date? Did you want to wrap it up with the date? Sure. Section ten, page eleven, lines seventeen to eighteen. Uh, this bill would take effect on July 1, 2024. Yeah, please. One, my final question, as I may say, um, is this is, I think this bill is primarily around sort of governance, supposed to be anyway, around governance, but it does seem to get a little operational here and there. And I, so I'm questioning, like on page four, when you're talking about providing students with Enrichment and exposure. Uh, oh, good uh, one. One, two, it's up top. Thank you, yeah. Uh, and then in nine and 10, genuine opportunities to participate fully, which, by the way, I am completely in favor of. But I'm just wondering if there if there needs to, like, is there an appropriation attached to that? And what exactly are we asking the schools to, to do? Because that does seem like added work. Um, so... I'll just leave it in it. Yeah. And it feels a little operational, but um, anyway. And we'll ask you to have yeah, all these questions right. answered by the secretary. I'm, I'm also happy to speak to that specific one right now, which is that um, in Act 127 of, of 2022, we were directed to the JFO contracted with the APA to come up with a report and study on guidance, we were directed to implement that report. And so that is specific, and I the report's deep in my bag somewhere, but that's specific to one of their recommendations. I recognize that it would be probably some cost on schools, um, and I know that that you know we are concerned about the cost of education. I know that the, the fees probably would have a similar perspective. We, we think carefully about those things. We still think it's an important thing to do it would be, again, we have one position request. We would be issuing some guidance related to it, I'm sure, and assisting school districts as we do with everything on technical assistance and things. We still think it's worth doing, um, and it is specific to one of those recommendations. So I, to your point about it being, we are punting very specifically on the governance. Everything else we're trying to get done this section that was in the APA's recommendation. Okay. So it's directly aligned to one of those. Thank you. More of a crisis question. Perhaps for yourself. In, in a bill like this, how come like, this is the intent of what, what, they, what the AOE wants to do? You know, all good efforts. Mm -hmm. Why is it the finance piece? Like, why is there a paragraph of the FTE? That's that's where the governor's FTE request comes from. It comes from the content of this. Yeah, you know, completely just. Yeah, it's a great question. We could easily. So I'm not sure the answer why the draft they didn't put the FTE person in here, uh, let them answer that. But we certainly can. And I think it's a, a worthwhile good. thing because we keep asking that how, you know, if we'd known that if we weren't in there because we haven't gotten the budget yet, it might. It just, it just seems to be a very pervasive problem Yeah, that we have legislation. And then way over there, in a different conversation, we have to talk about mm -hmm. the cost of that legislation. That's, That's a good point. Would you mind putting the person in to this bill? That would be terrific. And I suspect it would just be taking the language, the same language as the budget, or no? Unfortunately, no. The okay. budget language usually contains dozens and dozens sure. and dozens of positions. Um, so I'm happy to add that language. It is in addition, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's yeah. nothing wrong with that. You're going to want someone, mainly all of us, are going to have to track this position and the budget language. Sure. So that there's not. I, I get that. Just, we're seeing it in other committees as well. We talk about efforts, all good efforts, and then we talk about costs. It's like a, it's like an alcohol. 
all policy decisions for you all to manage? It's an interesting question. I wonder if we've evolved that way in part because people are afraid we might there might be mistakes where we double. It is know. extra work for all of us, you all and staff, yeah. to try and watch multiple bills that are trying to achieve the same thing. But, and then at the last minute, decide which one's going to go right. forward, right? Yeah. Um, that's not to say that you can't, that's not to dissuade you in any way of putting positions in your policy bills. But that, um, that's helpful. Yeah. 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 I like the idea of putting this position in here. I think it would really help for our colleagues and others to explain, you know, that hey, this moves forward. It's just not here to talk about CTEs, this position, how the work is going to be done. So that would be great. Do you so that would usually comes with an appropriation. Do you want me to just create the position with no appropriation or do you want me to add the appropriation? The the governor's budget have the appropriation. In it or no? Um, I don't. Ted seems to think it might, but at least the question is for you, sir. Um, it it may usually okay. the way, but usually the way that the budget comes out is that for position. I'll look into it. Um, but it would be something for you all to think about as far as where this bill goes, right? If you right. have appropriation. Yeah. Well, we know that I think all of our bills so far are going to appropriation. So, interesting. Least, you don't have a lot of money in your bill. Well, <laughs> literacy is going there. GTE, right. Prior to this, it might not have gone there. But I believe Senator Sheem's bill would go there. On, uh, I think the refugee bill, because you're acting. Oh, unless Scott Giles comes in and says we can deal with it within our budget. When I was counting, it looked like some bunch of things were gone, but I could be completely wrong. Um, I will add the position. Beautiful. And I will add the appropriation. And what Jane usually does is yanks the appropriation out and still the bill goes forward. And then hopefully we see it in the end. But I think it's good to put it in there. Great. Do I sit you around for a few minutes while Mr. Smith testifies? Oh, sure. And then we're going to shift to leverage. Do you, please, come on up. Use yourself and <clears throat> tell us your thoughts on S304, and then we are going to shift to libraries. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, hi. My name is hi. Bill Smith. I'm an attorney in Northfield, and I also have a lobbying practice that includes representing the Vermont Retail Lumber Dealer Association. That group has an interest in this 304 that I've discussed with your chair. Uh, it seems like numerous times already. So I hey Bill, we're gonna go around and choose ourselves so we know you know who's around the table since you're pretty new to this trying to turn your way from still Senator Dave Weeks yep. from Rob. <laughs> Richard Sears, Bennington County. <laughs> <laughs> the young Richard. <laughs> Our team will have you looked at for all the time they said Shane Linda Cal. Well, so my job is to sort of to tee this up for more, you know, your more detailed discussions with two of my board members, Tim Combs from yeah. Madison County and Ed Drew from uh, Wyndham County, uh, WW Building again, good real number respected, reverse. So uh, our members are have about 45 locations around the state. They provide the building materials for almost every uh, general contractor out there has to count with one of my members. So if you want to build homes, my members will sell you everything you need to do it, um, which is great. They also take part in the uh, building trade CTE programs, uh, both on the boards of some of the tech centers. Um, mm -hmm. They certainly uh, interact a lot with the students themselves uh, and know that either the students might come to work for them someday or they might be a customer. Uh, so they've decided that they've seen how it plays out. They understand the demographics in Vermont and we need more young people coming to the building trades. Uh, and uh, S304, uh, our board members met with the uh, some agency of education staff and, and the governor's staff online for, for a session. We're giving a heads up about this map that we supported. The short answer is we do. Um, and so not to get spend time getting in the way of you doing something we agree with, um, I can give you this in about five minutes if you'd like. Um, you know, looking at the reports, uh, 
the APA report, as you call it, uh, looking at um, the Institute of Education's uh, uh, documents that gave them on February 13th about leadership support and oversight, um, and looking at uh, Scott Farr's testimony for the CTE instructors uh, prioritizing those recommendations. Uh, in large part, members if they agree with that and support them, we'll do whatever they can to make sure that's the report gets passage. Um, it would say that um, the slight, so there's a very slight difference between the H716 and H304. The only one that jumps out to us that we would prefer on the H716 is uh, Section 10 of that bill has a specific deadline for doing the uh, uh, statewide calendar. So we'll be looking at that by September 1, 24 for the 25 26. Uh, school here. So this is in the House version. Of the right, that's in the House version of non mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, you know, we understand that, that that we'd like to flag as an issue for you. That's something that, yeah. we, you know, these are, you know, building trades. There's deadlines. Yeah. You, know, you got to organize and get your stuff done and, and do it when the customer wants it. And so we like deadlines. That's why we like Section 10 of 716. So it's Section 10. Okay, yeah. we can take over that um, separately. Um, one of the things I think it might have been addressed in uh, either Scott Farr's testimony of his understanding of where does the uh, the academic department or the embedded academics come in in this bill? It, I think it might be possible to do it by rule. I think was I'd like to make sure that that's a, either a clear assumption or if not, it might be something that because embedded academics is key. You've heard this before, I know, Mr. Chairman, in particular, where you know your English, your math could be embedded in in your uh, building trades class because. You know, you're measuring things, you're, you're reading blueprints, you're figuring out, you know, well, how to ask for the right, you know, equipment and and uh, materials to get a job done. Um, if you have to come back to school and go back to take another math class or take right. another English class, um, it, it can slow up graduation or it could make it so you have to work a lot harder to graduate than, than your peers are doing, for doing work that you're already really doing. It seems inconsistent to me around the state, but I've looked at it. But some some CTEs do that, some some sending districts do that, and some don't. So if there's a way to unify that perspective on that, um, we would definitely ask for that. So um, another thing in your in your bill here, uh, just in the interest of time today, uh, section nine, where you uh, talking about the post secondary program alignment. I just would point out that. The old Vermont uh, uh, Tech Center, now the Randolph Campus of Vermont State Colleges, uh, has a very active uh, engagement with the building trades programs. And so, if there's a way to get college credit at yeah. ESC, yeah. ESU, excuse me, for work they're doing in high school, yeah. like our other programs do, I would just say consider maybe adding number five in their building trades. Um, to give that some thought about uh, that's all how that affects what the Institute of Education wants to do if it's more or really not, but it's certainly something to think about because this program is key to uh, it, our key to having folks after they can build these new homes that we've been talking about and the government's been talking about this year. Um, um so, sorry, would you bring that back then, Ted, to the secretary for her to comment on Friday, number five being building trades? Thanks. Section nine. So section nine. I, I guess that kind of gets me to you know for teeing up here for, for Tim and Ed next week with you folks. I understand I think you're coming in on 28th. So I'm looking over at Morgan to say 28th in the afternoon. Uh, I think um, that's the general idea. Um, and that that will also lead into a reminder to you folks, and you'll be hearing from us later on that on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, March 26th is when we're doing the, the building trades uh, to every Tech Center in the state that's building trades is coming to the Randolph campus at Vermont State University. And the chair's been there in the past. Right. The events, uh, we're changing around this year. We'd rather have uh, you come and meet with your district's building trade students and instructors. They'll be there. Um, we'll, uh, and they're doing a, have lunch with them and talk to the students directly and find out what they need. I think that's the best way for us all to understand what maybe our students need for career development, what they see as being important to them going forward so that we're not all in this this beautiful bubble in the middle of the dome here and we're out listening to what our future uh, general contractors might want. And we're certainly listening to them. That's why we have this program that we do every year in March down at, at the Randolph campus. So the community group will be inviting you down for that. You'll hear from us after the, uh, the 28th of March. Is that the 26th, Tuesday the 26th of March. 
I heard you coming in February 28th. That's how it feels right. Okay. She's the other room. Yeah. So I kind of just chucked a lot of you right there. I hope I'm trying to get you back on. That's really helpful. No, right. that, that's helpful. Yeah. And what would, I guess I may be thinking about it if you have for me, I can deliver to them. What would you want to hear from someone that's on the board of the CT or a, a, a building supply company owner? Because one or two of them will be here next month. Thank you. Yeah, Senator Machine, maybe you have to practice ships, you know, with these contractors. I, I think that would be, uh, because I know, you know sometimes you have to get creative and you know, sometimes there isn't, you know, the brick and mortar building. To send a student, right? You know, are there apprentice shift possibilities for you know a high school student who wants to learn wants to learn carpentry, but you know that but doesn't have that program right. available in a nearby area? But right. One thought. Okay. Okay. I'll bring. I'll make sure that I speak to that. Thank. You. Thank you all very much. So just one quick it's question. Right. Actually, it's uh, maybe maybe more for for Ted's uh, attention. Yes. A question. Uh, the um the house bill the related house cte bill which has common schedules common bells call it common bells uh, i was just wondering if, if maybe we had a comment on that at this stage it's, it's a fairly significant shift. yeah and why it wasn't recommended for this bill i suspect you drafted theirs as well um yeah again sorry and again for the record ted fisher from my agency of education um so the agency requested uh, a sort of, um, so there's a lot of interest, just back up one step. There's a lot of policy interest in a uniform school calendar requirement, which this is a longstanding issue. When Secretary, former Secretary French was a superintendent, it was an issue and he was part of a legislatively mandated blue ribbon commission. We've been able to, unable to agree. Right now we have common calendars by CTE regions, but they don't match up fully. Sometimes there's an in-service day that isn't shared. Um, there's also a problem of what we call common bell time. So periods don't end at the same point, if you remember my comments last week. So we wanted to try to align the bell times and make sure that the concept. I'm just wondering right. what the AOE feels. About. So that's what we proposed. The house so has taken to this. So we need to know. Right. Okay. Correct. Anything else? No, sir. See you next Wednesday. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mr. Anderson. Welcome. Thank you. I think this is going to be relatively, yes, exceptionally brief. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the library bill. Just given that I believe we have Eric no, Patrick going in tomorrow to talk about firearm laws and the role of uh, whether or not we are jumping into areas that might be, have constitutional implications. I'd love to see a new copy uh, and a brief highlighted overview of 220, which I believe is probably in our folders. You should have a copy of draft 1.1 of the committee's amendment. This right. is a starting point for progressing through your discussions. Right. High level overview, uh, leaving committee last week, you had given me direction to remove the electronic literary product sections from the bill. And then you had a number of other sections that were uh, subject to further discussion and review, which remained in here for purposes of your discussions with forward with Eric and others. Right. There are only two substantive changes within this draft. They all later in the bill. Um, I first, in section 11 on page eight, have highlighted the provision related to the appropriations for libraries by municipalities. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you had focused in on in some detail was the clause that read insufficient amounts. Mm -hmm that is in space, sufficient amounts. And there was a committee discussion about replacing that with more appropriate term. For the time being, I've highlighted it and left it as the underlying language that does not have that clause. Thank you. Um, so that you can have that discussion moving forward. Um, towards the end of the amendment on page 10, a little bit of explanation here. Uh, 
you had given me some instruction to work with the state librarian to discuss whether the rules governing minimum standards for public libraries were something that the department wanted and would pursue. And the feedback that I received is that rulemaking authority was not necessary or desired. Okay. So that section is taken out and in its place is authority for the department to uh, discretionary basis, mm -hmm. develop best practices and guidelines for public libraries and library service levels. Um, because the rulemaking authority yes. and the electronic literary product sections are removed from the draft, those were the two pieces that had some required connection with an explanation of the General Assembly's intent. The rulemaking, because LCAR <clears throat> requires an expression of intent every time you are giving an administrative agency rulemaking authority, and the electronic literary product, because it's been subject to the federal and constitutional challenges under U.S. copyright. Um, with all those sections out, the expression of intent is not as necessary. So, <laughs> Mr. Sherman, do you want to say anything? We've removed that section, but I know you've been involved with talking with folks about copyright law. Can I just say a couple of words from there? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Nick Sherman, Leonine Public Affairs, representing the Association of American Publishers. Um, AAP's concern was with Section 2, so we appreciate the committee removing it. And uh, as you said, it, it related, uh, there's a legal concern and a fundamental concern. The legal one was uh, it infringed on U.S. copyright law. Uh, fundamental concern really being the ability of uh, authors and other content creators um, having the ability to earn a living under the protection of the copyright law. So. AAP appreciates uh, the committee's willingness to remove the section um, and will be submitting some written testimony just for just your record so you have it that goes into a lot more detail about the concern. Great. Yes. I did send you some language just now because I accidentally sent it to Beth just out of oh, habit. Okay. Um, but it around school, library, collection development policies, as well as reconsideration. Which I think they wanted specific language. Okay, great. Great. So in this committee and in uh, our other uh, morning committee, uh, there's been some comments about, uh, like, I'll give you an example, page 10, line one and two. This is a uh, diversity quality. Right? Right. No, no, Grant, I'm not, I'm not there. Okay. Uh, 10, ten line ten, one and two. two. So, you know, we keep focusing on race, et cetera, et cetera, but the word religion's dropped out of all these uh, kind of trying to be kind of inclusive comments. And I'm wondering if the intent was that it's somehow uh, embedded in ethnicity or or not. I mean, interesting question. It's, it's, yeah. it's consistent dropout. Now, and I can't, you know, I'll just I'll be forthright. You know, I'm not the most religious guy, but my constituents are noting it as a, it's a kind of routine now. And I'm wondering if that's, anyway. This is written as an exhaustive list. So if it's something that you want to see called out as a policy matter, it should be added to the exhaustive list. Yeah, I, don't, I don't quite follow. So there's two different types of lists that appear in statute. You have exhaustive and non-exhaustive. Okay. Non-exhaustive usually starts with the term including. Right. Okay. So you would have some sort of general requirement, and that might be, you know, policies that reflect Vermont's diverse people in history, comma, including race, ethnicity, sex, gender identity, sexual orientation. That means that it's, you know, a much larger list, and these are examples. The way that this is written is that this is, is exhaustive. The requirement is for these specific diversity classifications. So, so this is specific. Yes. So if you wanted to call out in the way that this is structured, if you wanted to call out religion as a basis for the policy diversity, you should call it out. Catherine, did you want to explain I, this? I think that I can shed a little bit of light on it and also make a recommendation. Um, I believe this language may mirror the language in the state curators collection development policy. Uh, the working group actually had more expansive language that included, I believe, religion and also political point of view. 
um, one of the members of the Board of Libraries also noted that I believe the word ethnic ethnicity is present, but maybe not race or vice versa. It's one or the other. So um, there may be a better way to address it than the exhaustive list. You might look at you, you might consider looking at either adding to the list, mm -hmm. which sounds like a good possibility. And certainly including religion is very important mm -hmm. and it's a, a freedom to exercise religion is so instrumental in our in our country, but also our libraries support that with learning and reading. And that's one of the things we want everyone, including youth, to have access to. Um, but I I would suggest that you might look at public accommodation law, which may have a, a longer list and might might be of use, but um, certainly the department is open to a right. very inclusive list here. We want people's uh, political persuasions. We want materials for people on all sides of the political spectrum and all religious backgrounds to be found in the library. Another one. Yes. Yeah. So by all political uh, views, progressives and democrats. <laughs> 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 so I did that my question here. So if you just mentioned uh, the public accommodation law, that everything would be included. Is that what you're saying? Possibly, but I would I would defer to counsel on that because I'm not sure that religion is called out expressly in public accommodation law, nor is public nor is um probably political preference called out expressly in public accommodation law. When we're talking about public accommodations, we're primarily talking about accessibility. Yeah, so so uh, we would maybe what you would want to look at is what Supreme Court jurisprudence is called suspect classifications. But again, you could turn this into a non exhaustive list, provide the examples that you want to call out expressly for the department to look at, including religion, political beliefs, socioeconomic status. Do you mind working with Senator Williams weeks and just put it or Williams a week seconds. and just put together something yeah. that the committee can look at just to add? I mean, I have no issues with it at all. It seems like it's a logical thing. It's certainly that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's uh, take five minutes.